This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. Hi, I'm John McElroy, and welcome to AutoLine This Week. Today, we're going to be talking with one of the top executives in the automotive supplier industry. And man, is the supplier industry undergoing a lot of changes. I think we're going to learn a lot in today's show because my special guest is Bob Pyle. He is the president of Light Vehicle Systems at Dana. He is also an executive vice president in the company. And Bob, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me, John. It's good to see you. Good to be here with you. Also joining us today is Gary Vassilash with AutoBeat Online. And hello out there in virtual world, Gary. John, how are you? I'm good doing to see you. well. Good, good to have you on the show here. Well, Bob, let's start talking about Dana. My, my first question is, I know as we record this, you're very close to announcing your third quarter earnings. I know you're in a quiet period. You can't talk earnings or stock price and all that. But I'm curious to know, how the company is doing during this pandemic. And the reason I ask is, looks like truck sales and SUV sales are doing quite well. I know you've got a lot of product on those vehicles. So I'm just curious how well you're holding up during this lockdown and pandemic. Yeah, thanks, John. So, uh, you know, we're really past the lockdown phase and fully into the recovery phase now. As you mentioned, uh, the market recovery has been quite, quite strong. I think uh, unlike a number of different segments in the economy in North America, uh, we're really seeing a V-shaped recovery with a very strong rebound, especially in trucks and SUVs and the, the products that, that we're supplying. So it's been a very, very busy time, a lot going on for really all the suppliers and OEMs in the industry, but uh, it's nice to be back making product and be back at the office, so to speak. And Bob, uh, Dana's traditionally been in traditional powertrain, but every time we turn around these days, there's a new EV company starting up or a new electric vehicle coming out. How are you positioning Dana to be on board with this trend? Yeah, well, John, for sure, electrification is coming and coming quickly, and accelerating. So a number of years ago, we set our strategy to accelerate our efforts in electrification and now to lead in electrification. And we've done about eight different acquisitions in the last 18 months to two years. And many of those uh, were to help position us to be successful in electrification. So our goal as a company is to be energy agnostic. So we wanna lead in propulsion, irrespective of the energy source in the vehicle. And we're making a lot of progress on that front and very excited to be part of the electrification of the industry. Bob, Jeep fans Jeep everywhere fans are familiar with Dana. Can you can you give us a glimpse at, you know, what are the things that you're providing to Jeep today that perhaps a few years back you didn't? And how do you see that going forward as they become more electrified? Yeah, so we're we've been a proud supplier of Jeep for 75 plus years, really right back to the very, very beginning uh, during World War II. Um, it's an iconic vehicle. So proud to be on it. We, we've been supplying drive lines uh, really since the beginning. So we provide front and rear axles, propeller shafts, uh, disconnecting systems, um, uh, locking differentials, uh, a lot of the components that really help the car deliver some of its iconic off-road capabilities. So, um, you know, we, we've been uh, very excited with the changes on the latest iteration of the vehicle. We think it's it's a terrific vehicle. Um, and as the vehicle electrifies, uh, we look forward to participating and partnering with FCA to uh, to support that. Bob, where do you see this heavy duty off-road market going in the sense that, you know, Jeep keeps expanding its uh, model lineup. Ford's about to come out with the Bronco, the Bronco Sport. I've got to believe that other automakers are looking at playing in that space. Uh, does that present new opportunity for Dana or does that just bring your competitors in with them? Yeah, for sure, John. I mean, uh, we see growth in the overall SUV market being very, very strong. This is a market, for example, in North America, that the, the whole segment has been expanding. We think it will continue to expand as, as the Bronco comes into the market. 
Um, and we see lifestyle vehicles and especially off-roading uh, being a segment that's growing, not just in the United States, but growing globally. Uh, we feel very fortunate not only to be a proud supplier on the Wrangler, but we're a proud supplier on Bronco as well. And uh, we think both of these vehicles have a lot of room uh, to perform in the segment and uh, will generate incremental sales. And, and we see the growth uh, being really a global trend, not just in the U.S. Bob, do you supply products to CUVs that are never going to see the off-road conditions that uh, the Bronco and the Wrangler eat for lunch? Sure, we do. Uh, we, we supply uh, all kinds of vehicles. In fact, one of the things that's unique about Dana is in addition to the light vehicle space that uh, I'm responsible for directly, uh, we participate in commercial vehicles, off-highway vehicles, construction, underground mining, agriculture. And one of the things that we like about being in all of these verticals is that we're able to provide uh, driveline products and ceiling and thermal products across an entire broad range of vehicles and share engineering, capital, best practices. Um, so we're supplying vehicles of all different types, including uh, in the light vehicle driveline space, Gary, like you asked, uh, non-off-road type capabilities. Uh, but we do see a real sweet spot where we can help partner with OEMs to really uh, help their vehicles perform. And that's off-road. It, it's even in the super sport area with our Dana Graziano uh, high performance products. Bob, it's interesting to hear you talk about how hardcore off-roading is really getting to be more popular, even outside of the U.S. market. Why is that? I mean, Off-roading's been around forever. How do you explain the, the sudden surge in popularity of those kinds of vehicles? Yeah, I just think um, the younger generation are more focused on experiences than necessarily acquiring uh, material goods. And off-roading and outdoor lifestyle is becoming increasingly popular around the world. I even think candidly what we've been going through with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is causing people to allocate their dollars differently and spending time outdoors, off-roading, camping, and uh, doing those kind of things uh, is, is seeing a surge. I, also, I think we can look to the biggest auto market in the world, China, and see that off-roading and that kind of lifestyle is really taking off there as well. And you know, with the numbers of consumers in China, that really gets going, uh, it's going to be a very, very big phenomenon. Bob, I'm wondering, um, you, you have this, this long history in terms of providing products to the industry. And as John mentioned at the top of the show, you know, we're still undergoing the COVID situation. How do you guys do product development to come up with new ideas that, you know, doesn't necessarily go back to your tradition and yet do this while, you know, conditions are so much in flux in terms of people being in offices or not in offices and, and so on. Yeah, it's a good question, Gary. I mean, one of the things we've been able to do very effectively during the lockdown is to still collaborate with our customers. And it doesn't always require face-to-face -face meetings or face-to-face -face interactions. I think we've all gotten pretty adept at using uh, video conferences and tools of communication other than the traditional in-office meetings. And when you have a long history of collaboration and very, very close, tight-knit customer relationships, uh, we're still able to do a lot of really good work from home or, or from wh wherever we may be to still move the business forward. Bob, we were talking a little bit about markets outside of the U.S. recently. Um, Dana's has a big push into India, which I find intriguing. I don't know if that's part of the business that, that you run, but I'm just very curious, you know, as an executive vice president of the company, what do you guys see in India? Could, could it possibly one day turn into the next China in terms of the size of its market? Yeah, so John, there are certainly similarities between India and China, but there also are some pretty big differences. Uh, the first similarity would be in terms of population. I think another similarity would be that in terms of vehicles owned per capita, they're, they're at a pretty low level compared to where they ultimately will be in the future. And that pretends well for significant growth. 
I think one of the differences is that the infrastructure in India is not yet built out at a level like it is in China, and that precludes some level of growth. But we see that as a long-term play uh, that's good for us. And we have all of our businesses within Dana represented. We sell to all the verticals in India. And uh, we, we think that's a good place for us uh, to invest for the long term. Um, when we did some of our acquisitions, they came with pretty significant India assets that we've integrated into the company. And we're now one of the largest ones in India and, and very happy to be so. Bob, before taking this job, you actually were um, running Asia Pacific for Dana. Can, can you give us a sense of the different auto cultures in, in different parts of the world as they compare to what you know we're familiar with in the United States? Are, are they similar? Are they different? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, Asia Pacific is just a huge region. It's really almost hard to fathom uh, the geography and the cultural and, and national differences that exist in that region. But you can imagine, um, you know, you have some pretty big domestic uh, auto industries and pretty big global automakers that come out of Asia Pacific. So you think about the Japanese OEMs and sort of their approach to the global market. You think about the Korean OEMs and how they've grown and become so sophisticated so quickly. And then you think about China. Not only is it the biggest domestic um, auto market in the world at you know around 30 million vehicles a year, but but that's a country that, especially with the onset of electrification, uh, will be able to more successfully export vehicles than they've been in the past because they won't need to homologate emissions, which has been a, a pretty big barrier in the past. Uh, and then you look at India, and they have designs on being global as well with Mahindra in Detroit and uh, uh, a number of these automakers looking to become truly global players. So I think that experience was was certainly very interesting. We're very pleased at Dana to have partnerships in all of these auto markets. And, and they're also very good uh, places to source from uh, as well in terms of components. So it's an important customer base in Asia Pacific also an important supply base for us on a global basis. Bob, how do you position Dana for this move to electrification in the sense that some automakers like a General Motors, for example, want to be very vertically integrated, do everything in-house or just about. Uh, you see somebody else like a Ford that at least at this snapshot in time pretty much wants to buy everything because they don't see the volume quite yet. How do you position Dana for this? And uh, do you provide complete turnkey systems or do you just sort of cherry pick which parts of the market you think are going to be the best? Yeah, John, I think one of the things that's really important in a time of change, this is really significant change. I, I think you have to be flexible. You have to be agile. And when you set a strategy, um, it, it really needs to have the ability to be adjusted. So as I alluded to earlier, um, our, our plan is to be energy agnostic. So whether it's electrification, full, like battery electric vehicles, hybrids, internal combustion, even fuel cells, frankly, we've been involved in for a very long time. In fact, a, a, just an interesting aside real quick, uh, we were recently going through our archives and found a photo of some of our engineers going back maybe 50 plus years doing work on a battery electric vehicle that had a string of 12 volt batteries in a, in a chassis. So pr pretty interesting. Uh, and as you know, John, and Gary, uh, when vehicles first came to the fore in, in the United States, a lot of them were electric before they were even internal combustion. So electrification has been around, it's coming back around again, but on a strategic uh, standpoint, we have to be flexible. We know different OEMs are going to have different strategies themselves. Some will do a lot of things in-house to, to basically replace what they already do in-house today in terms of internal combustion engines and transmission. Others may leverage the supply base more. And in some cases, it will be a hybrid where they'll do some vehicle electrification in-house for certain models and then outsource others. And interestingly, that's not all that dissimilar to what happens today in driveline. There is a mix 
of players who go to market differently and utilize the supply base differently. And, and we're prepared to work through that by supplying in some cases components, in other cases modules. And in our sweet spot um, with our key customers, we think providing full systems capability with the uh, gearbox, the motor, the inverter, all integrated plus thermal management, that, that's a real unique value that we can bring to the market. And we can do it not only in the light vehicle space, but in commercial vehicle and in off highway. So that, that's a real differentiator for Dana with the rest of the supply industry. Bob, could you talk a little bit about the competitive landscape as it exists right now? Um, have have there been changes as a result of COVID? Had things been changing you know, going into 2020 when um, we thought that we would begin to see a softening of the um, overall market? Um, what's it like out there on a day-to-day -day basis for a guy like you? Yeah, I think the competitive landscape um, changed as far as due to COVID isn't isn't huge. I, I think we're all dealing with the challenges of this big volume bounce back, this V-shaped recovery. And I think that's challenging for, for all the tier ones and, and tier two and three suppliers out there right now, especially if you're on trucks and SUVs. Um, I think a bigger game changer in terms of competitive landscape has been electrification. I think you're seeing some players um, really change their entire focus. Uh, you know, uh, ZF and TRW coming together was a truly transformational uh, acquisition. I think Ford Warner uh, acquiring Delphi would be another example of a major acquisition that kind of repositions those companies. I, I think with us, it's been less transformational and more targeted. We're, you know, sort of uh, sticking to our niche, so to speak, but we've acquired assets that really help us uh, become that energy agnostic supplier that can partner with our customers in different ways, depending on how they're electrifying or hybridizing their vehicles, and that we can do it across the range, like I was alluding to before. Mm -hmm. We do see uh, different competitors coming into the marketplace, uh, playing the electrification game maybe differently than uh, we've seen in the internal combustion engine environment. So it's getting more Competitive out there, uh, but we're feeling very confident in our ability to to win in in the uh, in the marketplace. Bob, when you oh, talk yeah. to uh, OEMs, oh, yeah. a lot of talk yeah. about data monetization, digital services, and the like. Any role for Dana in that area, or like you said earlier, you stick to your knitting? Yeah, I think there there is a role to be played in in certain cases. I think you know we've we've explored some opportunities in our commercial vehicle business, looking at uh, the ability to collect and monetize data and uh, work with our fleets on specifying uh, certain things like tires and uh, improve the fuel economy and create a value add for fleets. And we're seeing some traction there. I think, you know, an another way in which we're all using data is through Industry 4.0, the Internet of Things, to improve the uh, the, the, the manufacturing facilities and make ourselves more efficient, more capable. So uh, the use of data, big data and sensors on equipment, sensors on products is something that's that's coming. It's here to stay. And I think there'll be more and more value created in the manufacturing industry as a result of those capabilities. Bob. Despite the 50-year-old work that you guys did once upon a time on, on electric vehicles, are you surprised at the speed with which things seem to be changing in, in this whole driveline? You know, I, I'm not sure if I'm completely surprised. Um, for sure, I think we've seen things accelerating and picking up speed. I, I think it's really a combination of things. I think, um, you know, the diesel gate type issues really help to accelerate. I think the impact on the environment that we're seeing around the world with climate change are causing governments and cities around the world to really think about banning or dramatically reducing um, anything but zero emission vehicles. Even in California, you've seen the recent legislation that suggests by 2035, 
uh, vehicles that are sold in California need to be zero emissions. Whether that legislation will truly see the light of day or not, it's hard to say. But we do see this confluence of factors happening that is serving to accelerate a move toward electrification. But there are a lot of barriers that will need to be broken um, in order to have that proliferation really, really happen. Um, I think, as an example, infrastructure is still very, very important. Having the right charging stations uh, in all of these places will be key. I think battery technology is going to need to continue to improve, both in terms of cost and in terms of range, in order to have consumers be uh, somewhat indifferent between electrified vehicles and internal combustion vehicles, the way they're used and the way they're priced today. So there's still more wood to chop before we're there, but for sure it's coming and coming quickly. Bob, on the heavy truck side of the business, Dana is working with a startup. I, I think it's pronounced High Lion. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying it right. I've only read the, the, the name. But what I'm getting at is I got to believe that you've got a lot of startups knocking on your door because of the capabilities that the company has. Is that the case? Are, are you finding new customers running to Dana? Yeah, so John, it's it's highly on, and uh, they are a partner of ours, and we were an, an investor in that company as well. Um, and we do see a lot of interest in startups working with 100 plus year old industrial companies with our type of capabilities. Even some big tier ones uh, are looking to us for partnering in in areas of electrification because of our really strong mechanical experience and capabilities and coming together with other companies in you know areas like 48 volts where we've previously announced that we partner with Vallejo to go after some of the 48 volt uh, market around the world and, and that's partnerships bearing few fruit and uh, it, it's really interesting to see how the market dynamics are changing and bringing not only new competitors to the fore, new startup customers to the fore, but also some interesting partnerships uh, to approach and support the market as well. And, and how do you make a decision whether or not to go with a startup? Because, yeah. I mean, it's very low volume. It's, it's got to be uh, a lot of resources that you devote to it, but you don't know. They might turn out to be the next Tesla. Yeah, that's true. I, I think there has to be a good strategic fit. We have to have a good hypothesis about where the company's headed. Of course, we'll do due diligence on their on their plans and strategies. Uh, but we see a number of companies uh, that are quite innovative, uh, that are worthy of partnership in, in this new environment. And, and I think it, it helps to have a number of different projects going so that you have a higher chance of, of catching one that really takes off. Hylian was a good example of one that we felt good about and is, has proven to bear fruit already. Bob, do people from these startups come in and, and see your facility and realize that, gee, manufacturing is hard? Uh, there, there for sure are some differences between the, the startup mindset and the mass industrialization mindset. And I think Candidly speaking, they learn from us, but we learn from them too. So I, I think it's a good symbiotic relationship because, you know, 100-year-old companies can use a good dose of entrepreneurship. And I think we've, you know, with our acquisitions, we've, we've certainly been demonstrating uh, our entrepreneurial spirit. And at the same time, we're working with these startups to uh, help them industrialize. So we think it's a good balance. Bob, Gary, and I have been peppering you with all kinds of different questions here. Are we missing anything? Any anything that you know you want to bring out that maybe we hadn't brought up yet in this interview? Well, you know, one thing we only touched on a little bit was, um, you know, the the big news of, of 2020, which was the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. And you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say just how proud of our teams uh, around the world how thankful I am for how they've handled the adversity of an unexpected global pandemic and not only shutting down our, our facilities around the world when, when they went into lockdown, but also getting them back up and running and, and the big bounce back and supporting our customers. It's been a tremendous amount of work to keep everybody safe, to get things back to running. And, uh, you know, our, our first responders, our frontline are the folks in our factories who come to work and make parts every day. And I 
I really admire and respect the way they've come back and, and, you know, really been dedicated and been on those front lines to make sure that we can keep our industry humming. And it is really humming right now. That's for sure. Well, we can obviously see you're at one of your facilities. We see some operations in the background. Uh, wh what about your office staff? Are they still working from home or are they coming in? It's a mixed bag. We have we have the ability to come to the office. Uh, we, we are still divided up into phased groups and, and we see people uh, back and forth to the office, but we're still limited in our staff in the offices right now. Well, good. Well, with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. But Bob Pyle from Dana, thanks so much for coming on. Very interesting what's going on in the entire auto industry, but it's been really impressive for Gary and I to watch the evolution and the transformation of so many suppliers dealing with this change. Well, thanks, John. Thank you, Gary. It's been a pleasure being with you today. Yeah, Gary, always good to have uh, you on board. Love your thanks, questions. John. Thanks, John, and good seeing you, Bob. Thank you. And of course, I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode.